Hello everybody. This is going to be a quick tutorial on how to establish a good working environment inside of DaVinci Resolve. I'm literally at a brand new fresh install. I'm upgrading to 18.1 so we can step through this process. Now you're going to want to manage your media really well. I like to use an external hard drive. That way it's portable and it can go wherever I want. But one thing to keep in mind is having your footage in one place is one thing, but DaVinci is going to manage and maintain projects somewhere else. So I want to show you a neat way to make sure that all of your projects are portable, that you don't fill up your hard drive and fill up your external hard drives, but you can move around to different machines. Now you might not want to do this if you have a nice laptop and you've got a lot of hard drive space, but if you need to go to a school lab or you need to maybe move to another computer to do your job, then keeping your projects in a safe place on an external drive is a good um, thing to do. So let's jump into it. <clears throat> I'm looking at the home page uh, after install. DaVinci letting us know what's new in the software. I'm going to click continue and just be careful here. It says great, you're up to speed, but before jumping straight into a project, let's make sure you're all set up. So we're going to take our time here um, to make sure that everything is working just right. So DaVinci is firing up. I was expecting a couple of other pages to appear, but maybe the fact that I've already had DaVinci running on my machine, it already knows my preferences. So um, I'm gonna have to do some fancy footwork here uh, to make sure that all of my projects are stored. Yeah, so I'm upgrading from 17 to 18, so it's seeing that um, it needs to upgrade my project library. I'm going to hit upgrade. It's doing that attached to what's referred to as my local database. Now projects and caches, and caches are places where files get rendered when say you're doing transitions or fancy visual effects or you're adding audio effects. It goes into a cache and it's just a temporary storage place and it goes into traditionally the C drive on a Windows machine or into the users folder on a Mac. So you can see here, I've got lots and lots of projects and DaVinci has just updated that. Now all of these are currently running on my local hard drive, um, internal to my laptop. So I'm gonna <clears throat> now set up a new database, one that is portable that I can take with me to class. Now, looking at this screen here, which is the home screen, I can click on this little button here, and these are my project libraries, and they refer to them as databases. So down here, I can click add project library, I'm gonna do that, and it's gonna wanna know where I want to store this. So I've currently got my external hard drive plugged in, and yes, I do enjoy naming my hard drive's silly names. Um, my external hard drive is Josephine. So I'm just gonna highlight that and right on the root of the hard drive, I'm gonna put in a new folder and you can call this whatever you want, but I'm just gonna give it the name underscore DaVinci database for tutorials. Now you can call this whatever you want. Usually <clears throat> DaVinci database will do. That would be just fine. Um, and just hit create. And now this is where I want all of my projects to live um, for this portable context. <clears throat> and you can have multiple databases associated um, to DaVinci. You could have ones for network storage if you're working in a larger organization uh, that has fast network video storage, or you could, you know, work right off of the internal hard drive. So I'm going to hit open and it will need a name. So I'm just going to call this DaVinci database, keep it the same, or tutorial, and then hit the create button. Uh-oh, wah, wah, wah. XFAT is, and partitions are not recommended for project libraries and might lead to project corruption. So this is how I have my hard drive currently formatted. And I am working on a Mac right now, so it would prefer something like HFS. Anyway, I'm just gonna hit go. I think it's gonna be just fine. We'll see if it does break, and if it does, we learn something new. 
And then I've got myself here an untitled project. This is just the default project that has to be created every time we set up a database. And if I double click on it, then I should jump right on into DaVinci. Awesome. Now, if you've already gotten to this point where you're looking at the DaVinci interface, you can click on this home button here to pop open that user interface that we were just looking at. Right. So there's our local databases and we can even jump into networking now with a cloud. Yes, they do support even cloud editing now, which is super neat. All right, so I'm using DaVinci database for tutorial. Awesome. And as per my instructions for this project, I would like to first and foremost file. I want to take a quick look at my project settings. I always do this before I get started just to be sure that I'm working with the right resolution, 1920 by 1080 that I'm working in square pixels for YouTube. And I'm gonna change my project frame rate to 30. Cool. There's two ways to get access to that. We can go under file the long way, or down here in the bottom right, you do have access to this um, beside the house. There's a little cog. You can click on that and that'll pop up your project settings. And trust me, you wanna make this change before you get into editing, because Sometimes things can get a little bit um, confused later on if you make that global change. So we're good. Now, I've already, like Martha Stewart baking a cake, I've already downloaded all of my footage. So as I like to keep myself organized in a separate folder on my external drive, I have this directory named exactly like the storytelling assignment that I have given to my students. And you'll notice that I'm using this format where the first word is lowercase and then uppercase, etc. And this is what's referred to as camel casing. Some operating systems do not like spaces, and I'm not a huge fan of overusing underscores, although I do use them down here. Um, I do like to use as much camel casing as possible, and they call it that because you get these humps and you can easily read the words even though they don't have spaces. So in that folder, I've got a folder called audio. I don't need to have two soundtrack files for this project. I'm only gonna use the first one. And then even though the assignment only calls for five videos, I've just gone to town and really enjoyed all that wonderful video assets that are out there. And I've left one in particular here uh, named Week. Um, it is often that we download footage off the internet and we see names similar to this um, because the content creators don't really care uh, to change the file names. And I know that this is the first clip that I want to use. So I'm gonna use a serialized naming convention. I renamed 01 earlier, so I know this is gonna be my first clip. So 01 underscore, and I know this to be a cat. Now I'm starting to use words that mean something to me, which is super helpful um, when I'm trying to keep myself organized inside of DaVinci. And this is just strong media management. Make sure your names are appropriate. I mean, if you're in a filmmaking situation, that could be uh, scene four, take one. You might have different conventions, but for a small project like this, this is gonna work just fine. All right. So let's hop into DaVinci. I'm gonna grab all of my footage and I'm gonna put it into what are called media pools. So this is the big overarching area where we keep ourselves organized with all our files. And there is a page, these little buttons down here, they change the user interface for different purposes. Um, we've got media, we've got cut, edit, fusion, color, Fairlight, which is music and audio editing, and then the deliver page, the rocket ship, which is one of my favorite features of DaVinci. So I'm gonna jump back into my media management, and this is just a nice place to organize yourselves, put stuff inside of the media pool, start to create these things called bins. Um, so I'm just gonna grab all my videos, I'm gonna just hold shift and click and just drag them on in. 
it might take a second for it to ingest all the footage because it's interpreting it in real time. Now this is going to pop up, you know, change the project frame rate because it's determined that some of those other videos might be 24 or even 16 frames or 29.97. Just say don't change because we changed it to 30 earlier. So just say don't change. And we'll now have all of this footage come in um, as original uh, frame rate. So I'm gonna highlight all of these things. I click on the first one, hold down shift and hold, and click on the last one. And I'm gonna right click. And there's an option in here to create a bin with selected clips. Now a bin is like a folder. And over here, it says bin one, and I'm just gonna call it. I clicked on it once. I'm gonna change that to video. So up in the master project, we've now got a folder called video. They called them bins because back in the day they used to have film reels that were actually in wooden or plastic crates. They were in bins that had numbers on them. So they just brought that over. And similarly, I could right click in here and I could create a new bin if I wanted to. And I'm gonna just call this one audio. Double click on it. And then I'm gonna drag my soundtrack into that. It might be complaining because it doesn't like the file format. That happens from time to time. So I just had to hold down for a second. And yeah, luckily my audio is muted, but normally if I mouse back and forth on top of this clip, you would actually hear uh, the scrubbing of that audio. And what's cool in this media pool area, you can always double click on things and you can see what's actually going on. This is the waveform for the audio. If I go back to video, I could double click on something and see it up here. If I have my speakers turned on, I could scrub the timeline. That's what we call it when we drag the playhead back and forth. It's often referred to as scrubbing the timeline. And we can see what's going on in our core footage. Awesome, super good. Now, let's go to the actual editing pages. Now there are two inside of the software, one referred to as cut and one referred to as edit. And when I first saw DaVinci in cut mode, I wasn't terribly satisfied because it didn't feel like the software I enjoy, which is Premiere. So I'll show you what I mean. If I drag this down here, it's great. I can see a preview. And then when I grab the red line and try to drag it to the right, it doesn't do anything. I actually have to drag the timeline to the left, which is sort of counterintuitive to the way I like to work. And then it suddenly occurred to me, it's like, oh, this is like Final Cut. Oh, Final Cut. Mouse over it, cut. Oh, really? They took the paradigm of Final Cut <laughs> and the next button over here, which is edit, click on that one. Oh, this looks like Premiere to me. Now I've got all kinds of things turned on up here. I've got my media pool on, there's buttons in the top left, the, my effects are turned on. Normally you would see it with just your media pool. I've even got my inspector open from the last time I edited. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Your inspector is so important, so is metadata and mixer. Um, but when you click on any one of these buttons in the top right, um, it's going to fly out this drawer and then you get to only see one video here. So I'm going to close my inspector and I see two. I see my cat and I see this whale. Now the right is actually the timeline that I'm editing on. Hence the fact it says timeline one. Since I dragged something down onto the timeline in the previous page, it's automatically created this thing called timeline one. Now this is gonna be my outputs. This is actually my in-class assignment one. That's my thematic video. So I renamed it here and you will see immediately it's renamed it also here. So this is my timeline. This is the thing down here where I actually do editing is my timeline. And it just got created automatically the first time I dragged footage down into this area. We'll talk a little bit more about how to be specific about your timeline generation in, in future classes. 
Um, so, I'd like to be able to see more of this footage. Well, I can mouse over this dark line here and increase that. That's awesome. It's done a few things, actually. It's given me more space to work, more access to tools, but it's also given me this handle here, which is really nice, because if I drag it over, I can see that for five seconds, and so here, four seconds and 12 frames, it's going to fade in. So I have a look in the top right here, I press play and it fades in over that period of time. A really nice control that they've given us here, this little handle that allows us to fade in and fade out our videos really quickly. It's super beautiful. Now I'm gonna drive this mostly by my audio. So I'm gonna go into that bin there and here's my zero one soundtrack MP3. I'm gonna drag that down onto audio two. Cool, so it occupies now all of that space, but it's really long. If I scroll back and forth, I see that there's a lot of length to that uh, audio clip that I just put in. Now, getting into zooming your tools is really important. And that's what this slider does here. We can zoom in and zoom out. But the more trips we end up taking up here to click on these buttons, um, the longer it's gonna take you to do work. So I've just learned that with command and scroll, I believe that's going to be alt and scroll on a PC, or control and scroll on your mouse wheel, you can actually scroll you're gonna to have to play around on PC. I'm holding down the Option key on Mac, but either Alt or Control and middle mouse scroll, or I'm just two fingers scrolling on my touchpad, that's gonna give us this ability to scroll in and out. And it always scrolls in and out wherever you have your playhead. And the playhead is this little red line up here. Now my project is meant to be two minutes long, so I could try to put my playhead exactly at two minutes, or what's better, I can right click on this audio clip here, and I have to have it selected. You'll know that a clip is selected when it has a red line around it, and right click on it to get these options, and now I can change the clip's duration. And a little review, these two numbers here are frames, and we're running at 30 frames per second. So I'm going to zero those out. These are seconds, zero seconds, and these are minutes. So this translates into two minutes. So I'm changing the duration of that audio clip to two minutes. When I hit change, it should shrink. Perfect. And now I know visually this is exactly how long I want my project to be. That's the end of two minutes right there. So to handle the audio, I may as well fade it in I can make it get louder over time. And then at the very end of my video, I can have it nicely fade out like so. Cool. And now the rest of this is actually pretty straightforward for what I'm expecting for this first assignment. I'm going to just start dragging footage into my timeline. Now, some important ideas. Let me grab bird. I'm going to put bird down here. You'll notice that if I just take things out of my media pool and I drag them down onto my timeline, you look carefully, you can see the audio from the bird clip is wanting to overwrite and destroy my soundtrack. Now you could drag this down to V2, the, the second video layer, and it'll put the audio on A2. But then you gotta do this thing with the little linky tool and unlink them and then click on this thing and delete it, which you can do. Or you can get into more finesse editing. But you double click on this and it opens up on the left viewer. Remember the right one is what we're gonna actually export. This is our final cut over here. This over here is just a preview of our footage. And if the video happens to have an audio layer in it as well, you'll see this icon. So there's video and there's audio, video and audio. And you can isolate each one and just grab what you want. So I just want the video, you can drag it down and it'll leave the audio behind. 
but you have to be very careful to put your mouse right on top of the little film clip icon and drag it down like so. So let's make a few more cuts. So I'm mousing in the, the forest drone video and I'm not seeing those two buttons pop up and that is because there's no audio in this. So when I drag it down to the timeline, it didn't overwrite the audio. How about Pride of Lions? It does have an audio layer, so I'm gonna carefully bring that down. Now, what's really important to note is that with non-linear editing, this is what we call a non-destructive process. So this, in other words, this footage is safely stored on a hard drive, and it doesn't matter if I take the blade tool, that's the red tool I just selected up here, and if I start cutting it, like chop, 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 and I, you know, delete these middle parts like that. Um, well, th that didn't destroy the actual source footage, right? Um, in other words, I have access to show the viewer the footage that I just cut away. Now, if I look carefully, when I mouse around on my clips, there's a special moment where these brackets with arrows pop up when I click on it, you can see in this white box that there is actually footage for me to show the viewer. Now, it's only a certain duration, uh, and there's the end, and uh, Da Vinci is kind enough to show me that with that fuzzy red line that you've reached the end of the possible footage. And you can do that from both sides, which is really great. So you can do editing that way. or you could be a little bit um, more advanced and say for this footage here, the fish, I want to define in here where the clip starts and ends. I just want to take a middle chunk out of this. So if I slide my playhead over and say, I want to start about here. Well, there's this option to mark an endpoint. So by marking in, you're telling DaVinci that this is actually where this clip's footage is gonna start. Slide this over and say mark out. Now only this region in here is going to show up on my timeline when I drag it down. See, it's a tiny little sliver. But I still have access to all of the stuff. So I might have to put my playhead right on top and then scroll in a bit with my zoom tool up here and a zoom down in so that I can even gain access to these handles. Okay, there's those brackets and then I can click and oh, there we go. I can see from that white box uh, below that there's more footage before and there's still more footage after. Yeah, that's great. And then just tuck them together. Now, one thing you gotta be really careful of as an editor is to not have any dead spots. Like right now we've got this moment in time and if I press play, you'll notice in the top right preview that it'll go from footage, beautiful lions, black to fish. So this tool here, this magnet, it's for snapping and it helps to keep us honest. Um, when we move our playhead with the magnet on, it'll snap to the end. If I take footage like this and slip it to the left and it'll snap to that previous clip, now we have a perfect straight cut. Press play, we won't see any black frames. But if we turn that off, and we can now move our footage around uh, willy-nilly. There's no snapping, so I can be very accurate and move stuff. And see how I can see that little black box is giving me some information. It's telling me how many frames I'm moving that clip over. And one black dead frame in the middle there can ruin your day. Let's see what that looks like. It's very subtle, but it's very unprofessional. It just dips to black, blink, uh, even though it's just a couple of frames. So you can either keep the magnet on and just make sure that you're snapping your footage together or right click in between the two, 
highlight that area to see how it turned a little bit lighter gray, right click, and then press the ripple delete, like so. All right, I'm just gonna quickly add some more footage, like so. Whoops, made a mistake. The audio from this clip literally overwrote that. So, undo, let me grab bunnies. What about that one? Oh, it's gonna overwrite the audio. Uh, how do I do this? Double click, open it up inside of this viewer here, grab just the video footage. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, you could just put it on V2 and blah, blah, blah. Um, I could do that if I wanted to hear the sound of the bunnies making bunny noises or the fish making fish noises or the lions. Um, I could put that on V2 and mix it together with my audio, but I just want to hear the music for this project. And that is pretty much that. I now have two minutes of video. We fade in and we always fade out. So let's see what that looks like. This is a fade slider. So is that gonna fade out nice? Yeah, fade to black. I did the same thing at the beginning. Might be a little bit too long. So I'm gonna fade in. Nice. Now, you could, you could say, okay, that's way too much whale. I wanna get rid of some of that whale. So we can grab the blade tool and cut, cut back to the arrow tool, grab the stuff in the middle, delete it. Forest drone, let's grab waves drone shot. Let's use that one. And I wanna put this into there. Hmm, how do we do that? Well, there's this button here, insert clip. So if I highlight that and I press insert clip, oh, bummer, huh. it overwrote my audio and it pushed stuff out of the way. Mm. Well, let me do it the long way. I'm gonna cut this down to a very, very tiny clip by pressing I, slip down, O, in and out. Same as clicking these two buttons here. And then I'm just gonna drag the video down. And if it's smaller than that space, it's gonna fit in just nice. Now I can grab the tail, snap the head, snap, and that's perfectly cut in. Nice, bunch of straight cuts. Don't have to worry about transitions. Don't worry about transitions right now. We'll get into all that stuff down the line. All right, so let's export this so that it's ready for YouTube. And this is single-handedly one of my favorite features of DaVinci. It's the rocket ship. You click on that guy and it will have the previous timeline that you were working on loaded into the exporter. That's really what the rocket ship is. It's intended to help you to easily export your stuff into all kinds of different formats. But wait a minute, YouTube, Vimeo, Twitter, Dropbox, hey, <laughs> nice. So you can literally put all of these profiles together at once to be rendered, and they'll push the videos to all of these places. So I'm gonna actually just choose YouTube 1080p. It takes the project settings, which is really nice, 30 frames per second. It does all of this jazz for us. You don't have to worry about it. But then there's this option down here to upload directly to YouTube, and I haven't honestly had a lot of um, success with it, so I turn that off. And then we need to give it a file name. So this is gonna be my in-class project one thematic visual story. And the reason I like to name my stuff, when I download, when I upload it, download, when I upload it to YouTube, it'll actually make this the file name. So if I carefully do this now, then I can just literally press space bar and, and fix this up later. So browse, may as well use my external drive that I'm using, Josephine, and I've got DaVinci Resolve data for tutorials, and I'm just gonna put it in there. So it's backed up on my external drive. And then this is a, tricky button to find, but it says add to render queue. 
So you can make as many of these profiles as you want and just keep adding them to this queue over here. So I'm up here under YouTube. These are all my settings. And then I add it to render queue here. And it pops up here and it's ready to be rendered. So click render all. This shouldn't take a lot of time. Render all and it scoots along at a good clip. One thing I really appreciate about DaVinci is its renderer is much faster than a lot of other tools that I've used. Its outputs are faster, often watching visual effects and titles and sound awesomeness uh, run in real time. It's fast. It's really fast engine. It's amazing for free. So that's done. I now have a video on my computer. So somewhere out here on my external hard drive, Josephine, I should see and here. I don't have my speakers turned on right now. So let me do that just to make sure I got the sound out because it's super critical that when you've finished off a production that you don't just assume that it's perfect. Any number of things could have gone wrong and could, including like just a weird computer blip where it might have made crackly noises or something. So I'll turn on my speakers and turn my volume down so it doesn't feed back um, into the video too much. And I'm just going to take a look on Josephine under my new fold. There's my project. Nice. Sweet. And I'm going to look at it. So if this was my project, I would look and listen very carefully, very carefully to make sure that there wasn't any weird glitches, that we weren't suffering from any awkward moments where a transition didn't work, or maybe we had a dead black frame by accident. Like none of us want to make these mistakes, um, but they happen. They always, professionals see it happen all the time. That's why we have multiple levels of editorial uh, in filmmaking, just to be absolutely sure that that stuff is working. And you could even like right now, for example, just see a like noise across the screen um, because something in the computer didn't work. The software, no software is perfect. Right? There's always going to be little glitchy moments. But really, I'm going to skip to the end. We got our bunnies and it should fade out. Audio fades out. Awesome for days. Totally good. Now somebody in class asked me, what do we do with this thing? Um, so I'm going to just hop over to YouTube and I'm logged in. So I'm going to create video, upload video, and then all you got to do is drag and drop this like so. If you don't feel comfortable right now with showing this to the world, then you can set it to unlisted, right? And this is a weird one. Is it made for kids? No. There's more options that we can do if we set it no, it's not made for kids. We'll talk about that more in class. But just because it's a clean video, like mine is clean, I always still say no, it's not made for kids because there's other things in uh, subtitling and stuff like that that we can't do uh, with kids shows. All right, so next, next, next. And this is where you could set it to public if you're proud of it or unlisted if you just want to hand it in to me. And that is the YouTube URL that you uh, submit to me. So that's click copied and that's what you paste on into Blackboard and, and, and send my way. Hit save, sit back and wait and get ready to become a multi-millionaire YouTuber. <laughs> All right, everybody. I would like for you to have a ton of fun with this project. Happy editing. 
See you guys very soon.